this. Sorry. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this fourth webinar on, on long COVID, where we are focusing on self-care and long COVID, specifically looking at self-care within the context of you know, what you eat. Um, there's been quite a lot of talk about the use of supplements in Zimbabwe. There's a lot of talk about using um, traditional uh, plants and herbs. Uh, there's a lot on Zumbani, uh, there's a lot on Mur uh, Moringa and uh, all those different kinds of plants that people are using. And then we've got the aspect of your health uh, that is important in terms of self-care. And we also have to look at our mind, our emotions psychologically and in the workplace. How do we work uh, within the context of, of long COVID? So we have four uh, very interesting speakers who are going to give us their thoughts on these key um, themes. And we hope you will all participate by sharing your thoughts and questions, whatever you want to pose to our four presenters. So we have Kirsty Baxter, who is a nutritionist. Susan White is an occupational therapist. Uh, Dr. Shelton Zichawa is a medical doctor and physician. And Dr. Jonathan Brakash is a clinical psychologist. And uh, without any further delay, I would like to invite Dr. Zichawa, who will give us a brief a uh, 10 minute presentation, and this will be followed by Kirsty Baxter. And then after that, we will have uh, some questions before we move on to our last two speakers. Over to you, Dr. Chao. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. So today I'm talking about self-care and long COVID. I hope you can all see my screen, please. Can someone confirm that you are seeing my screen? Yes, we are seeing your screen. Thank you. So I'll start with what is the self-care. Self-care is a multi-dimensional, multifaceted process of purposeful engagement in strategies that promote healthy functioning and enhance well-being. It is a conscious act one takes in order to promote their own physical, mental, and emotional health. So there are so many forms of, uh, of uh, self-care one may take. You know, just for example, ensuring enough sleep every night, you step outside for, for some time, you take a bath, you eat well, you look after your health, you exercise. Those are some of the forms of self-care. So the definition of self-care, uh, according to the World Health Organization, is the ability of individuals, families, and communities to promote health, prevent disease, and disability with or without the support of a healthcare provider. So yes, you may, you may need a healthcare provider, but this can also be done without a healthcare provider, and it is, can be associated with the with this include self-management, activation and improvement, promoting independence, self-directed care, and health literacy and collaborative care. So these are six aspects of uh, self-care. Well, self-care is time that you dedicate to you. So it's your time, you give it to yourself with the intention of boosting your, boosting nourishment, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual health. You can divide these areas into physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual, personal, and professional. So these are some of the examples. For example, physical, exercise, take a walk, do yoga, get enough sleep, psychological, join a community, write a journal, check your mood, declutter, emotional, take deep breath, positive affirmations, love, and gratitude. Spiritual, meditate, 
go to church, forgive yourself, spend time in nature. And uh, personal, you have to treat yourself, listen to what you want, unplug from technology. These are just examples. Then professional, read a book, eat lunch, record your views, pick, and all those things. So during long COVID, these are some of the things which one can actually initially do, start now. Physical condition, awareness of the environment, be kind, pick the right choice, attentive to your health, to your guidance, practitioner, your priorities right, what you want to do which is within set you in. Also, exploration, you need support, you need to forget that you are, you've got a life to live, and also the acceptance of what the condition is set upon. Africa's benefits of people's attitudes and behaviors, quality of life, clinical symptoms, and the, the ability to use care resources. So it encourages one to maintain a healthy relationship with oneself so that one can transmit good feelings to others. So these are things which self-care does. There are many of them, but I just picked this to boost your physical health. Make a person a better caregiver. It provides a break from time alone in general soothing feelings. And there are a lot of other things which one can associate with the benefits of self-care. Characteristics of effective approaches to supporting the people involved in decision. I used to tell people what to do, but in self care, we have to involve in decision making. We need to emphasize problem solving okay? and uh, developing care plans as a partnership between individuals and professionals. We need to set goals and following up. We need to motivate people to self-manage using targeted approaches and structured information and support. And then this comes in the use of telemedicine when we have to deal with these patients when they're at home and we're healthcare providers so that we're able to advise them, you know, using telemedicine. We also need helping people to monitor their symptoms and know when to take appropriate action. You know, when we have to embrace digital, embracing digital healthcare, these, these patients, assuming they would restore problems, they have to have a pulse oximetry, they will be checking their oxygen saturation at home, then checking their blood sugars, their blood pressures at home, and then communicate with the healthcare provider so that they are involved in the in care of, of, of their problem. And we, we need to help people to manage the social, emotional, and physical as impacts of their condition. There's a proactive follow-up. We don't wait for these patients to come to us, but we have to engage them and follow up on what's, what's happening with them. We also need to provide opportunities to share and learn from other service users. That is information sharing and research is very important in this era of long COVID. It's a new disease. We need to be sharing and everything. So what can one do? You've got the long COVID, what can you do to help yourself? Functioning and quality of life ranges from mild um, to severe. You may you may be able to take up the opportunity for engaging locally in activity in the past time that you enjoy or that you'd like to try you know, during this time of long COVID. And it is important that you consider self-care for your general health, such as health, eating, sleeping, exercise, particularly if you're local, they stopped you from doing those things. You know, these people, some of them, they, they've they now been limited capacity to do what they were doing before, and they have to start learning and doing what they used to do before. Then you should do, it's important to work with your healthcare professionals to say that are realistic, eat exercise, eat physiotherapy, rehabilitation, and then, these goals to be meaningful and at a pace that is appropriate and right for you so that you don't leave, you are not left out being exhausted, especially for those people with this chronic fatigue syndrome. But we should also understand that there are limitations to self-care. 
Okay. The term itself, self care kills the detail implicit ever as autonomy in the actions of individuals, but the capacity to undertake self care is not natural. We are not born with the ability to do self care. We need to be taught. And there are also barriers you should be aware that will limit the ability for people to carry out this attitude of self care. For example, limited knowledge. What is it? Lack of social support. Do we have that in our community? You know, to to deal with these issues with our patients to do self care uh, activities. There could be complexity of regimens. What we advise? I cost one to do teaching and teach our health care medicine, but do they have uh, the guidance to do all these things? Then there's also guilt because uh, in self care it's your, your your time, which means you are going to be to you are going you are not going to have much time for other people. So they feel guilty because they're not giving that time to those people. And because they're engaged, these people are also caregivers. They look after their families. They we should also understand that self-care growth measure is an implicit concept. It's a concept which could be new to others, okay? This may be because the self-care is challenging to grasp and tricky to define. So it's sometimes very difficult how to define self-care to someone. What someone thinks is usual, is normal. Someone what when it comes to cultural practice may affect even for interpretation of the term and their widely divergent perspectives. While is it is tend to assume that taking care of one's own health is that of one's own Deny the complexity of the population in our country and the legal. I think this is common sense, but what you understand, what you know is that common sense is not all that common. Actually, it's a rare commodity. Why is self care important during this long COVID? You know, because of long COVID, after I've recovered from this terrible illness, acute COVID, and long COVID, one could feel helpless, discouraged and occasionally out of control, okay? And this means fatigue and sleeplessness. Taking care of oneself is important so that one is equipped to help one's family through this difficult time. It reduces or limits anxiety, depression, reduces stress, improves concentration, minimizes frustration and anger, increases happiness, and improves energy, and are more of other things which it does. It is our duty as healthcare workers, we need to listen. And we need to believe what our patients the long COVID are telling us. Okay, and we need to avoid stereotyping because this is something new, and uh, we've not encountered it before. But we need to accept that it's there. When our patients tell us they're having problems, we need to listen. We need to believe them, and we should not just think that uh, these guys are just being spoiled brats. So we not we should not to stereotype. So today, please, can we try these activities for self-care during whether it's the long COVID, even also including the acute COVID, we need to recognize and validate grief. These people have lost relatives and they've also been left very sick and able to do a lot of activity. To practice, please tell them, practice mindfulness and focus on the moment. Separate out what you can and cannot control. Connect with nature. Take breaks from the news. A lot of news, you know, very negative things coming in the news. Notice and manage your worried thoughts and connect with others. These people have been in isolation. They have to move out of isolation, share away from all people through COVID. Practice gratitude and pay attention to moments of joy. You need to live your life. Find a balance between routine and the flexibility of your body, stay, stay physically active. Thank, thank you. I'm done, Dr. Chibanda. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zichao. Uh, in the interest of time, um, I would suggest that uh, we move straight on to Kirsty Baxter. Thank you for that very um, broad overview of long COVID, uh, Dr. Zichao. Questions will be asked 
as soon as Kirsty has finished her presentation. Kirsty, over to you. Thank you. Dr. Sichao, if you just unshare your screen. Thank you. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Following on from, from Dr. Sichao is I am Kirsty Baxter. I'm a band registered nutritionist in the UK. And it's my pleasure to present a very short overview of some of the things you can do in a self-care scenario. So we know that long COVID has produced a wide variety of systemic issues, including brain fog, fatigue, and in many cases has increased existing pain. What we know from COVID-2 COVID is that it enters the cells and destroys the mitochondria at a, and the cellular receptor ACE2, which is found in interstitial epithelial cells, including the risk of gut dysbiosis. Gut dysbiosis means you're going to have a lot of symptoms from bloating, cramping, a combination of diarrhea or constipation or both, uh, or one or the other, and a number of other gut issues. This virus causes mitochondrial distress, which we have seen is what is causing long COVID. So the aim today is to talk you through a few small steps to uh, restore ACE2 and improve mitochondrial function by optimizing your lifestyle. Uh, and diet. So for me, lifestyle, for us, lifestyle is related to nutrition, which is diet and hydration and includes sleep, which is a really important component because this is where the body helps to regenerate itself. And today I will then also be talking about supplements as uh, Dixon allude, alluded to very important in long COVID. And then I'll touch briefly on a way to stimulate the parasympathetic uh, nervous system, which Susan White will take in depth. Sorry, I don't know why this is not moving. So sleep, sleep hygiene, we talk about uh, on a regular basis within a normal nutrition, but it's really important in a long COVID scenario. So we want to try and help reestablish the cadian rhythms, which means keeping regular hours of going to bed and getting up. The sleep hygiene relates to keeping a dark room, keeping the noise down. And then, as I mentioned earlier, activating the vagus nerve before sleep is a really helpful way to help calm the body down, get the mind and the body connected, the breath and tone, and to help calm the whole nervous system down. So the activation of the vagus nerve is included at the end of this presentation, which everyone will be receiving. And then the thing we often know but don't, don't often do is that we stop use of all electronic devices 90, 60 to 90 minutes before bed so that there's none of that white light stimulation on the brain. We also know with sleep in general health, but in particular here in long COVID, that a magnesium deficiency is often associated with insomnia and sleep disorders. And it is a crucial enzyme in over 300 different functions within the body and a large number of cellular processes, including your day-to-day -day energy or ATP production from at a cellular level. So going back to why we're talking about the mitochondria, it is implicated as a deficiency in migraines and headaches, and then very important in cognitive function and then depression and anxiety. So here again, the brain fog that we are seeing in COVID-2, in long COVID, is really relevant that we look at our magnesium levels within our body. And then we know also from um, athletes and people who are highly active that it's very important in, 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 muscle, in muscle synthesis. So um, helping with restless leg syndrome and any sort of muscle weakness. And then it's also obviously implicated, its deficiency is implicated in chronic fatigue. So one of those really important essential cofactors for so many aspects within bodily function. 
And again, very important in neurotransmitter synthesis. So in the brain fog capacity and the areas where we're talking about the brain fog. I'll talk more in depth about other supplements. So it's dosage and form will be included there. Sorry, I'm struggling to get this to move. I don't know why. So on a nutrition level, first, I talked about the importance of hydration. We often forget how important hydration is. We generally made up of about 50% water. So that's really how important it is for our bodies. And particularly during this phase of long COVID, we want to make sure that all our organs are getting the required um, hydration so that we can have the cellular level working properly. So a good quality of water and lowering your toxic load, which means lower if at all caffeine, low if at all alcohol and keeping your fizzy sugary drinks very, very low. So there's not a lot of new evidence available on long COVID, but we have seen in a recent study from 2020 that plant-based diets, which included more total vegetables, more total plant protein from legumes, from so your beans and your nuts, and less poultry, less red meat, and less processed meats were really important, including with that less sugar, so lowering your sugar intake and less alcohol. This study showed that those who are on a low carbohydrate diet, where there was, um, where participants were having very high doses of protein and red meat, very high quantities of processed and refined foods, all of which are inflammatory, so pro-inflammatory, had a three times greater increase in moderate to severe COVID and implications then for long COVID. So we are seeing that diets high in fat and sugar destroy intestinal mi microbiota and can lead to dysbiosis, which again, the reason being is it modifies the intestinal mucosa and makes the tummy lining, the mucosa or tummy lining more permeable to pathogens. And as a consequence, establishes low grade inflammation. So then when you keep up with the poor diet, you can you mediate that inflammation, you continue that inflammation in this process. So why plant based not because it's currently a fad, but we are seeing in a number of different research uh, papers and including a few on the recent long COVID studies that an anti inflammatory diet which is plant based is also more nutritious. So it has more enzymes, vitamins, and cofactors, an example like I gave you earlier of magnesium. All of these nutrients are cofactors and are important in a number of metabolic functions. Um, and in general, plant-based diets contain more fiber than meat-based um, diets. And why is fiber so important? While we only need 20 to 30% of the diet from fiber, it encourages the growth of beneficial bacteria in the microbiome. So the healthy bacteria in our gut, it then nourishes the gut and supports a small thing, a production of butyrate, which is anti-inflammatory. And that butyrate will get through and support brain function. So it's all interconnected. Another aspect which is important in a healthy diet while you're suffering with long COVID is to make sure that you're optimizing the probiotic content of the gut. And that in itself helps you create a stronger immune response. So we know that probiotics from, from multiple years of research, and we're seeing more and more now, are very important to help with altering the mucosal barrier dysfunction and making it healthier and stronger, and in so able to mediate um, immunity. And we also know that it is important in, in, in um, diseases like chronic fatigue or viral post-viral fatigue. So, um, and it can lead to these can lead to pro-inflammatory cytokine production and immune dysregulation. So poor diet is never going to help us. And when you're really suffering with a severe condition like long COVID, you want to really optimize the mitochondrial function that is at a complete throughout the body at a cellular level uh, in, at the gut. So all really important for that. 
So then I said to you, and unfortunately we don't have a lot of time, it's quite quick. I'm talking about supplements and I'm gonna highlight just a few that are really important. We know that most people are already on things like zinc and vitamin C. So I've highlighted magnesium. And again, what's really important with supplements is that they are a good quality supplement and at the right in the right form. So for magnesium glycinate, which is the most absorbable form, and it can be in anything from 100 to 400 milligrams taken at night as it's is a natural muscle relaxant. Vitamin D3, a lot of people are on this already. It is immune protective and it favorably modulates cellular defense and mechanisms and can be taken in doses up to 500 IUs daily, again, with food. And this is the important part. You'll see these supplements are all with food. Omega-3s, again, which have high uh, quantities of doxyhexanoic acid and episapentoic acid, all are very anti-inflammatory. Again, they have omega-3s have something called apelin, which is a peptide hormone, which increases the production of ACE2. Doses can be between 1,000 and 2,000 milligrams a day with food. Vitamin C contributes to the immune defense and support and reduces free radicals. So the oxidative stress that is happening in our body Importantly, taken at least an hour away from food because the caffeine in, uh, sorry, an hour away from tea or coffee because the caffeine depletes vitamin C's absorption. The same with the B vitamins, they're water soluble, need to be taken away from caffeine at least by an hour. The three important ones are thiamine, vitamin B2, and niacin. So these are really important specifically during a long COVID suffering. And then as I talked to you about probiotics, we're two of the most widely used to support the, the diversity of the microbiome, or lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. You can also obtain these by including more fermented foods um, in your diet. And lastly, I touched on zinc. I don't really have much time. So there will be information there about zinc and how important that is, particularly when deficient, it's hard for the body to fight the infection. So zinc is important. I've put the forms there between 15 and 20 milligrams. A lot of people are, are using curcumin again, a lovely one. Important if it were as liposomal. So that is the most absorbable form. And then right at the bottom, I've talked about berberine, but I've talked about activating the vagus nerve. So unfortunately, there's not a lot of time to go into this, but hopefully you all get um, the presentation. And, and as Dr. Chow mentioned, please go and see either someone like myself or similarly get the help you need. Don't keep suffering and Googling because there's a lot of information out there and it's not always specifically personalized to what you're going through or taking into account any other medications that you might be on. And thank you very much for your time for listening. Thank you very much, Dixon. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kirsty. That was really insightful. Two questions to kick off um, this first round of questions for, for Kirsty and Dr. Zichao. Um, I will start off. Kirsty, would you recommend people who've had COVID to go on magnesium? Would you um, encourage people to become vegetarians? And for Dr. Zichao, how does a person who has had COVID know that they have long COVID? You know, I had COVID in December and from time to time I feel fatigue. Sometimes I have to take a little nap in the afternoon. Um, is that COVID or is age catching up with me? Uh, when I go for a run in the morning, I sometimes feel a bit tired, more tired than I used to. Is that COVID? What should someone who has had COVID do in order to establish whether they have long COVID? Two questions from me for the two of you, and then we can also look at questions from, um, from our other participants. And um, maybe you can kickstart off that the response, Kirsty. Thank you so much, Dixon. Two very good questions. I wouldn't necessarily say that you have to become a vegetarian or a vegan, but we definitely are seeing the importance of making sure you're adding more plant-based foods to your diet. So increasing your vegetable consumption. And if you are eating red meat and chicken, that you're lowering those so that you are optimizing the anti-inflammatory capacity of the foods that you are eating. 
So those would be my recommendations. The second question, magnesium is not implicated in many drug nutrient interactions. It's something most people or a lot of people are already on. We all know brands that they take at night. So definitely if you are suffering with those conditions of fatigue and brain fog, we are seeing a worldwide deficiency of magnesium and zinc. And that has been like that for the last few years out of research. So definitely those, that would be something to consider. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you, Kirsty. Thank you. Um, Dr. Zichawa, would you like to respond to the second question? Thank you. Uh, long COVID is a diagnosis of exclusion. There is no specific diagnostic test to say this definitely is long COVID. So a person who has had long, who has had acute COVID, whether it was severe or mild, then developed these other symptoms, which we discussed those symptoms of long COVID. We need to investigate and exclude other causes which could cause this those symptoms. Once you have excluded all the diseases which could cause the symptoms this person is experiencing at a point in time, then we will label that that person is got or is suffering from long COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we can take one more question. If anyone else would like to ask a question before we move on to our last two presenters. Any questions for Kirsty and uh, Dr. Zichao? Dixon, I've seen a very good question in the chat box. If I may answer one related to uh, a histamine uh, response or intolerance. Very good question. May I quickly answer that? Please go ahead. So the question is a large number of COVID patients are suffering with uh, a mast or histamine intolerance. Uh, so low histamine, a low oxalate diet have been proven very helpful. So absolutely. So a histamine response is again an inflammatory response, and it can be resulting from a number of different things. So there are quite a long list of histamine foods that should be uh, avoided. And I'll just give you a few off the top of my head, but we could possibly send more information if this were required. So you're looking at aged and fermented foods. Uh, generally, so any of the processed foods like hams and bacons, those are all processed and um, fermented. Yogurts, chocolate, wine, beer, uh, cheeses. So a lot of the fermented foods create uh, or should be excluded, including oxalates and their different types of oxalates. So it's too, too extensive to go into here, but definitely keeping the di diet low with these. So all aspects that we can do to lower it in an inflammatory response in the body is important. So very good question. Thank you, great response. Any other questions before we move on to, um, before we move on to Jonathan and Susan? So there's one question here. Um, how long is the time interval between the vitamin C and coffee intake? I have also seen research that says vitamin C on an empty stomach works and some say no, need to be taken with food. That's a question, does it need to be taken with food? Which one would you recommend? Any difference between the powder and the pill forms? I like that question about the coffee. Thanks, I'm curious Aiden. what you have to say. I am addicted to coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dixon. As I mentioned earlier, right at the start, keeping our toxic load lower. So the liver is working very hard to detox the body. And in inflammatory conditions, you're putting more strain on the liver. So keeping your coffee intake lower, it's a toxin. Uh, so keep that lower. The very good question, Aiden. You want at least one hour between taking the vitamin C and definitely with food. Uh, and one hour away from the coffee. So otherwise you're depleting its absorption and therefore you might as well flush it down the toilet. Generally, vitamin C is made with ascorbic acid. We are seeing recently in the last few two years, liposomal versions of vitamins are now available. It makes them two to three times or three to four times more expensive, but they are basically attached to a phospholipid, which means it gets better absorption in the stomach and three to four times more potency than non-liposomal supplements. So most of the vitamin Cs you're seeing around are generally 500 milligrams of ascorbic acid. You can split that up into 
two doses a day, so a thousand milligrams, or if you could opt and afford the liposomal vitamin C, uh, that is the best form. And again, taken with food one hour away from coffee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we won't take any more questions because we are running out of time. Jonathan will be our next presenter, followed by Susan, and then we will take questions before we close for today. Jonathan, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all. So, okay, let me just do this. Okay, I'm just trying to get this off. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen, yeah. Jonathan. Okay, Please I'm go ahead. Try. Yeah, okay, great. I'm just trying. Yes, to, I can uh, see your screen. Good, I'm just can trying to get- to slide to... Show. Yes, we can ah, see the screen. Okay, Thank great, you. thanks everyone. Yeah. So what we're focusing on now is our mind because that's what we have control over. So this is focusing on what you can control and what you can't. So what you can't control, you go with the flow. And then now we're gonna talk a bit about what the flow is all about. So with the flow, there are four parts to it. The first part of which is F is find yourself. With all the symptoms and anxiety that we're dealing with with long COVID, we lose ourselves, we lose our grounding. So it's very, very important to find ourselves. And I'll show you those exercises in a minute. The second thing is to like yourself because your immune system is affected by your state of mind. So I gave us the challenge of like, not love, but just like yourself, because how we feel about ourselves and our situation definitely has an impact on our immune system. The next step, which is O, is observe yourself. This is the ability to step away from things that are very anxiety or panic producing, and just to step back so you can have an objective perspective. And finally, W is widen your life. Long COVID makes us very narrow and very isolated and alienated from people. So it's very important to make the effort, and we'll look at how, to step back into life whenever we're able to. So this is on finding yourself now. So you want to check in with your body, just simply scan it, see where the tightness is, see where there's pain, discomfort. Just to say hello to it. You wanna check in with your mind, What's the quality of your mind? And finally, you want to check in with your energy. You want to do this throughout the day, several times a day, so that it becomes second nature, so that there's a constant communication going on between your mind, your body, and your energy level. And fireflies is a technique where basically you imagine that all of your energy flying around is like fireflies. And what you do is you coalesce it into one ball of energy, and you feed off that ball. Some people use a petrol tank. You may have another image. But it's very important to just look at what your energy level is at different points during the day. And that will guide you in terms of your activities and what you want to do. The next step is to ask yourself, what do I need? So take a slow breath in and a slow breath out and just pause and ask yourself at this moment, having done this assessment, what do I need? And see what answer comes. Then we need to ask some key questions. What takes away our energy? What gives you energy? And really, once again, navigate that through the day. You really have to be strict about this. Also, what is important and not important right now? Once again, when we had full energy, we were able to do everything and we didn't have to be so discerning, but now we do. And finally, what do you have control over? Past, present, or future? Think about that for a minute. And the answer is present. You only have control over your present moment. So that's where you want to put your energy. Thinking about your past doesn't get you anywhere. Thinking about a future that may or may not happen doesn't get you anywhere. It's simply a waste of energy. So let's go to the next thing. Like yourself. I put this in because it's a particular challenge, I think, 
loving yourself, I think, is quite an expectation. So liking yourself is more reasonable. Our immune system is stronger when our body and mind are in a calm, relaxed state. So we need to have a positive view of ourselves to feed our immune system. The big question is, do you like yourself when you have a long, when you have long COVID? And what often, if the answer is no, not especially, which is what I hear from many, many people, the question then is self-pity and self-blame. How does that affect how we react to others and how we react to ourselves? So be aware when we get into self-pity and self-blame and really question, do we really need to do this? And then helplessness and hopelessness. That's another common reaction. And interestingly enough, there was a recent study by Michael Treadway of Emory University, who discovered that in response to brain inflammation, our body cuts its dopamine production. And this cut in dopamine production is what creates a lack of motivation and depression. So that helplessness and hopelessness you're feeling is actually often biochemical. It's not you, it's biochemical. The other thing is, what are your sources of affection in your life? Hopefully this will help you see yourself in a better light. And finally, let go of what you were. Be interested in who you are. Very important. Let go of what you were. Be interested in who you are. Now. So observation of ourselves is very important. And we have three things we're working with. Our mind as a whole, but specifically our awareness. The awareness of just watching what's going on. This is the mindfulness that Dr. Zichao was uh, addressing. And we watch what happens in our body, once again, ideally with just awareness, just watching, not grabbing onto it, not running away from it, just watching. And we watch what happens in our environment. But all of these affect each other. So as much as, as we can do to uh, get the environment in our body and our awareness to support ourselves in our healing, that's what's important. And we'll discuss that in a minute, how. So the next step in the flow is O for observe yourself. Our mind can be our best friend or our best enemy. Create an observing self. I have a name for mine, it's Oscar. So the idea is to just have this observing self. Mine sits on a deck with a beautiful view over in Yanga Valley and has some nice cool drink and hangs out and just watches my life on a large screen TV. So it watches my ups, my downs. And the idea is it just watches. No judgment, stays calm. Also observe your levels of anxiety, panic, and helplessness. It's all okay. The idea is just to watch. And we don't have to, we often panic about being panicked. We often get anxious about being anxious. The idea is step back, sit somewhere beautiful with your observing self and just watch. The other thing is to notice your habitual thinking patterns. What are the stories you create about yourself? What are your responses to the stories? And the clue is take a few deep breaths and do something different. Perhaps if your story is, why does this happen to me? Getting into the self-blame. See if you can react differently. Okay, and that's how we begin to form a new neural pattern. And finally, the W is widening your life. With chronic illness, our lives can narrow and we often feel alone. So we have to ask ourselves some key questions. Right now, are you surviving or are you living? Which means learning and interacting with the world. And we may find that on certain days we're surviving and certain days we're living, and that's okay. But it's important for us to reach out to the living if all we're doing is surviving. And so we need to ask ourselves questions of like, what gives your life meaning? For some people, it's petting their dog. For some people, it's looking at a beautiful flower. For some, it's playing with their children or grandchildren. So very important. And noticing, this is part of our awareness, noticing what's happening in our body. What in your life causes you to contract? Meaning move away from people, move away from life. And what helps you to expand and fill with life? And the other important question is you breathe in, then out. So you're settling and then ask yourself, what do I need to heal? And often an answer will come some days. Yes. Some days, no. And sometimes the answer might surprise you. 
It might be as simple as rest. It might be listening to music. Enjoy the surprise. I think the important thing is that our body wants to heal and we can do the things which help it. Make a list of all the things that can help our body to heal. And Dr. Zichow and Kirsty who did such a beautiful job, both of them, you've already gotten a partial list of all the things you can do. So finally, from reading all the various chat rooms in different countries, there seems to be a long COVID continuum. The first step is depletion emptiness. The second is just having enough energy for survival. And the third is interaction, you know, is interacting with the world. And so you may be moving between that continuum in a day, certain times of day you're totally empty, or you may find that different days you have different energies. And just to simply be aware of that. But the goal is to stay in the flow. The goal is to do the flow so that we don't react as strongly as we might. We don't have to panic. We don't have to be anxious. We're just watching how our body and mind deals with these differing energies. But we need to have faith that our body is trying to heal and that we're gonna do things that will help it heal. When life gets difficult, we have two choices. We can either change our situation, and if we cannot do that, we can change our response to the situation. Getting into the flow gives you a tool, a boat, to change our responses, <clears throat> which may, interestingly enough, then change our situation. And it allows us to navigate our lives through the rough waters of long COVID. So I hope you've gotten some ideas then of ways that by being in the flow that we can deal more gracefully with what happens to us in our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. That was really insightful and profound. I have a question for you, but maybe we could move straight to Susan and then we will have questions for Jonathan. Susan, please share your presentation. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you can see that all right. Um, my name is Susan Wyatt. I'm an occupational therapist. And I'm going to wrap up this session with doing some body integration work for you, um, which uh, the other three speakers have brought in beautifully about um, breath work and um, our nervous system and calming our body <coughs> down being present in our bodies. So I'm only, I've only got one slide to talk to, um, and then I'm going to invite you to um, join me in some chair yoga today. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to just um, show this slide with you. It looks very complicated, but in fact, it's, it's, all it's doing is showing you a stress map of our body. And this is, um, when I do this with clients, I often reduce it to what I call the traffic light system. So just the green, orange, and red zone to make it easier to understand. But if you look down the left-hand side, it lists um, your states of arousal through your body, your muscles, your breathing, your heart rate, your blood pressure, all the way down to your social contact with others. And what we're seeing with COVID and particularly long COVID is that people you are moving up from this green zone, which is our calm zone, our, our place where our body is relaxed, our heart rate is fine, our breathing is fine, our contact with other people is normal. And we're moving up into this orange zone, into um, a fight or flight zone. Um, because of the fear, the tension, the sickness, the physical symptoms, and then all the confusion around treatment or not treatment, we often move into the state of tension, okay? And this is not good for our bodies, but it's also not good for our social contact. We can't um, nurture relationships when we're at this point. And if the stress stays and doesn't actually leave and we can't come back down to a green zone, we go even higher sometimes into a red zone. Um, and depending on your illness and what you've had to experience, sometimes that can be really quite traumatic and it can overwhelm your ability to cope. So I liked um, how Jonathan talked about F in flow is find yourself. So what, what I'm trying to share here is we need to understand our own body's reactions. We all go through these zones at different rates and different intensities. So we really need to know ourselves, know how we, how we react to stress and what we can do 
to put the brakes on, to bring ourselves back down to a green zone where our bodies can come and our mind can come with us. So I'm going to show you one way to do this is through body integration work. Sometimes when we're in this orange or red zone, just saying to ourselves, calm down is not really going to help. So sometimes we can use our body to help bring our mind back down. So I'm gonna invite you now to take off any glasses that you might have on. You can take your shoes off, um, push your chair back. I'm going to move just to here so that you can actually see um, the whole of me. Um, put your feet flat on the floor. Yep, shoes are off so that you can, you can feel the ground, you can um, be grounded in yourself. Hopefully you can hear me still okay. Um, I might stop, do I need to stop sharing the screen and then you can see me completely. Okay, so come to sit with your feet flat on the ground. You can even close your eyes for a moment. Just take your awareness inwards into your body and just start to notice your breath. Your breath is what connects you to your nervous system. So just taking a few conscious breaths here. And then you just follow my instruction. We're going to do about five minutes of some chair yoga and just doing some deep breaths. And just notice how your body feels. So opening your eyes, using your hands to describe the level of your breath. We're going to take a deep belly breath first. So down from your belly, then your middle lungs, then up to your top lungs, reaching up. Drop the chin down and breathe out. Again, breathing in, belly breath, mid lungs to the top lungs. Drop your chin, breathing out. Empty all the way down, empty to the bottom of your lungs. And last time, breathing in, reaching all the way up. Drop the chin, breathing out. And let's take it wider now. As you breathe in, take your arms wide. We're using our ribs and our arms to help expand our lungs. So obviously in COVID, that's a very important thing. And again, taking a big breath, take it wide. And down. And this time as you breathe in, take it wide and pushing your hands out to the side. From the base of your palms, take a big breath in. And out, as you breathe out, expand into your fingertips fingertips to shoulders, and starting to make big circles with your hands. Touch your elbows in front if you can, and wrist behind. Breathing out as you come down, breathe in as you go up. And just notice, are you holding tension through your shoulders, through your neck? Okay, and other direction, coming forwards now. Take your hands up, and exhale as you come down. So keeping your fingertips on your shoulders, just really trying to expand into the chest. Inhale to come up. Exhale, fold the hands down now onto your knees. And as you breathe out, curl the spine, looking in at your belly button, tapping your chin. And breathe in, coming up to sit. Nice and tall, look up at the face, open the throat space. Exhale, breathing out, coming down, curl the back, tapping your chin, look at your belly button. Breathe in, coming up, all the way up, open the heart space, open the chest. And then coming to have a neutral spine, making big circles with your nose. So you don't want to crunch into your neck. You want to just loosen up the jawline, loosen up your neck. Inhale to come up, exhale when you go down. Okay, and other direction. And just finding your body's rhythm, so observing, no judgment, just noticing yourself. Okay, and coming to neutral, hands on your thighs, squeezing up the shoulders, leaning forwards and coming back. Leaning forwards, breathing in and coming back. Leaning forwards. And then turn the palms over. Take the arms, the shoulders back up, 
and come forwards. So we always want to do a complementary opposite movement. And just noticing again, if you have tension up through your spine, when we're in a state of stress, we often don't move our body. So getting back into our body is a really good way to feel better. Okay, then breathe in, take your hands all the way up and turning to face behind you, holding onto the back of your chair and doing a nice spinal twist. Breathing in to center and to the other side. Breathing into center. One more to each side. And this is a good way to also squeeze into your organs and giving them a flush out. Breathing into center, taking your hands onto your chair and lifting up one foot at a time and making big circles in one direction. And I wonder how many people have forgotten about their feet. We're all in our heads. We're all looking for treatments on the internet. What about getting back into our bodies? And other foot. So like we're saying, the things we can control, you can even do this in, on a chair, in your office, at work. Just small movements to get yourself feeling present and feeling like you have control of your self-care and your health. And both feet together, can you make big waves with your feet? Scrunch up your toes, take them wide, widen out your toes and scrunch them up, and take them wide. And then coming up to standing, just a couple of minutes of balancing poses. If you can, make sure your chair is steady, but you can use the back of your chair. Balancing poses are very good for steadying the mind because we can't be thinking about other things when we, our mind is busy. So taking a hold on the chair if you need for balance and taking your foot up, this is called tree pose. So if you're feeling steady here and you can let go of your chair, you can bring your hands to prayer. If you need something to look at just on the ground to help you gaze and stay steady and focused, you can do that. And then taking that foot down, let's change sides. So the other leg comes up. If you're feeling steady here, Take your hands into prayer. And just taking a few conscious breaths here. Okay, taking the foot down and coming up onto your toes. Coming all the way up. If you feel steady here, take your arms up above your head, all the way up. And then drop the hands behind your neck onto your shoulders and push your head back into your hand. Beautiful. So keeping steady. Keep breathing here. Your breath is your first indication of your nervous system changing. Big breath in, hands come up, all the way up. Exhale, hands to the side. Inhale, hands come forward and coming down. And for the last one to help us open our lungs, take a hold on your chair, take your feet back and drop your chest down towards the ground. So this is really opening up our lungs. And just taking some nice big breaths here. It's a passive movement, so it helps to open your lungs without you having to do it with muscle. When you're really coming up, Walk your feet forwards. If you can, take your legs wide, cross your arms, and just come in to hang your spine and your head. Just let them be loose. And this helps to open the back body. Just taking a few breaths here. And slowly bend your knees, lift up your head, let the blood drain out your head and come up to standing. And I'd just like to end on one last pose. 
which is also a theme that the other presenters have talked about. So sitting with your feet flat and your palms open to the sky. So we call these willing hands. These hands are willing to let go of what we can't control and willing to accept how we are at the moment as it is. And you can close your eyes for a moment. Just keep your willing hands open. Just accepting where you are right now. Just notice your breath. Slowly opening your eyes, wiggling your fingers and your toes, coming back to the room. And that will be all for me. So thank you very much. Back to you, Dixon. Great. Thank you. That, that, that was really great. Um, we're coming to the end of today's webinar, but we obviously have a number of questions for both uh, you, Susan, and, and, uh, and Jonathan. Um, maybe I can kick off with um, a question for for each of you. So, um, Jonathan, your your presentation was really really profound. Uh, a lot of insightful uh, bits uh, and pieces about what we can do <clears throat> to help ourselves um, as we struggle with long COVID. You know, one of the hallmarks of COVID is just this this miserable feeling of, ah, you know? So, and you talked about liking yourself. You know, how, how do you like yourself when you feel miserable, helpless, and hopeless? You know, what maybe one take-home strategy can you share with people, you know, which, you know, something that they can go home and actually start implementing um, right away? Uh, and then for, for, um, for Susan, my question is, those um, exercises were great. I was, actually, I was actually doing it as well. But, you know, one of the things that, you, you, that, that, that is often uh, observed in people who've had COVID is this fatigue, this pain, you know, muscle ache, joint pains. I certainly went through that. What advice do you give to people who can't do those exercises? What can they do? Is there a way of modifying some of those exercises so that people can, um, can actually utilize them? So those two questions from me, and I'm sure there's a couple of questions um, from other people as well. Maybe Jonathan, you can start. Okay, great, thanks. So in answer to when you're feeling horrible, um, and I like the sound effects, Dixon, um, what, do we, what do we do? I think a few things. One is if we can find things that give us even the smallest amount of pleasure, you know, or the smallest amount of hope, um, that's the first thing. You know, whether it's hot tea served to us by someone who cares about us or watching the sunset, whatever it is for those brief moments. Uh, distraction helps also. Um, you're forced to change your expectations, which isn't easy. You literally have to go with the flow. And if you can stop sort of saying, I should be well, I should be well, I should be well, and just instead just say, okay, this is where I am and accept it, that this is where I am for now, it makes the ride easier. It makes the recovery, however long it takes, easier. That's my answer. Thanks, You're Jonathan. Muted. That's, yeah. that's, a great, that's a great response. Thank you. Um, Susan, would you like to respond to the question before we ask if there's anyone else and then we close? Yes, sure. So I took two parts from your question, Dixon. Um, the first part is definitely you need self-awareness. Um, and I think we've talked about that. All the presenters actually talked about that. Um, so knowing where you are in the stage of your illness or in COVID, um, but also knowing for yourself what, what triggers you, what brings out your energy, what depletes your energy, um, and knowing how to pace yourself. So I even think Christy mentioned in the beginning, start with two or three minutes and try and build it over time. So it's a balance between knowing yourself and being able to strengthen yourself versus putting yourself in distress or causing yourself more harm. 
Um, so not everybody can go in and do, you know, a full Ashtanga session is actually an hour and 15 minutes. Um, we wouldn't be recommending that to people that are experiencing fatigue. However, you can build yourself up over time. And the problem with COVID is particularly with the fear, but also with the fatigue, it often collapses you mentally and physically. And so moving your body is actually a good way to help your mind feel like you're not collapsed. And if you can't get outside and you can't manage your full walk out in nature, then doing some gentle yoga at home can at least get that movement back into you. Um, and you asked about modifications. Yes, there's, there's lots of different types of yoga. Um, there's also different variations within a yoga. So this was chair yoga today. Um, you can also do it passively lying down, um, anti-gravity movements to just get your breath coming back, just get your movement coming back. Um, maybe alleviate things like pain or lower back pain or muscle fatigue. Um, and then and you can go all the way up to standing poses and balancing poses. So I tried to show a variation today that um, might have been accessible to most people. But yes, lots of different variations. Thank you. That's, that's great. It's great to know that there are lots of different variations. Last question, and then we close. I think we have to give you all an opportunity to respond to this question from Ampofu, which says, I have come across patients who have lost their sense of smell or have a distorted sense of smell six months or more post COVID recovery. How do we assist these patients restore their sense of smell? This is for anyone, including Dr. Zichao, um, if anyone has um, any ideas on how to deal with this. And we will give ourselves a maximum of two minutes to respond to this question because it's way after three o'clock. Yes, go ahead. You know, basically, you need to, to, to do a proper medical examination. A proper ENT you know, referral to see that everything is fine, is working in order. Some of these people, we we do trial of uh, drugs, some, you know, some protocols which we are using nowadays, which we include probably prednisolone, some ivermectin, and the full fluxetide, hoping that the, the sense of smell or test if you don't do anything. Otherwise, it's more of uh, counseling and psychotherapy and talker therapy, hoping that we time heals most problems. Thank you. Thank you for that, for that response. So obviously it seems it's a, it's a multidisciplinary approach to that response where you have different specialities coming together to address such a um, situation. I would like to ask Jonathan Brakash to maybe um, close today's webinar. As you may all know, this initiative was, um, was conceived by Jonathan. And um, the idea is to, to really expand the long COVID um, you know, support, not only in Zimbabwe, but beyond. Jonathan can share with us what's going to be happening next and when we are likely to have our next webinar. Jonathan, over to you and then we can close. Great, thanks Dixon. First of all, thank you so much for everyone who attended today. Uh, it's really important that we all share the knowledge and we all contribute what we know. And as you can see mentioned, and it'll be mentioned again, I think on the in a minute, there are lots of groups that you can join. There's a long COVID group for people who've experienced long COVID. And then there's also a health professionals forum on LinkedIn for people who want to join and just share knowledge that they have in, with each other. Um, next on the cards, I think what we're thinking about is that continuum between hopelessness and helplessness and suicide, because that's been coming up quite a bit. And then the hope is also, as we're learning together, we're slowly developing potential curriculum and we want to look at models for uh, disseminating the information on a community level, on a professional level, et cetera. And then finally, the big picture is how do we move this whole long COVID knowledge and awareness uh, movement forwards? 
so that uh, people suffering from long COVID can receive better care within the African context. And those providing that care can be more knowledgeable. Okay, thanks Dixon very much. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you all for attending this webinar. Um, and we will be informing you of the next webinar when uh, we have a date. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thanks everybody, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye.